Hello, I'm your host, Gray Waste Tim, and you're in the den of the Gray Waste. Today, we will be taking another look at the influence that H.P. Lovecraft has had over George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. George is a writer who very much wears his influences on his sleeve, and he is borrowed heavily from the writers of the past that he grew up with. Uh, this can be from Tolkien to Chambers to Michael Moorcock and a lot of H.P. Lovecraft. For example, George will take whole scale entire ideas and names from Lovecraft, split them into two, and then repurpose them across, across his world. And this can be done in a number of ways. Ib is a great example. In the original Lovecraft story, The Doom That Came to Sarnath, the city of Ib is populated by little frog guys called the Duma, who worship a stone idol of a giant water lizard. George takes the name Ib, he applies it to an island, puts his version of Tolkien's dwarves on there, but he takes the stone idol of this water lizard, this sort of salamander amphibian, and he creates the Isle of Toads, where a giant stone statue of a toad is worshipped by some very fishy-looking people. And then the frogmen is applied on a symbolic level to the Cranog men in the neck. So you can see, he took this whole scale Lovecraft idea, broke it up, and repurposed it all across, all across his world. And the same happens with a shy. A shy is very much influenced by the Lovecraft story, The Color Out of Space. Chiefly, at least what I hope to achieve in this video is that Ashai seems to be a massive version of the Nahum Gardner farm in the color out of space, which later becomes known as the Blasted Heath. Basically, the idea behind this video is, what if the Blasted Heath, what if Nahum Gardner's farm and everything that happened there, but on a citywide level? Now, if you've been following me, and my guest appearances on the David Lightbringer YouTube channel, you'll also know that on top of being a huge Lovecraft fan, I'm also a fan of Dave's Moon Meteor Theory, which is a theory that explains a lot of the weird happenings in the world of Ice and Fire. Moon Meteor Theory is based off of, partly on the Carthian legend of two moons, that there used to be two moons, but one wandered too close to the sun, and cracked, and a thousand dragons came forth, drank the fire of the sun, and then rained down to Earth, or, or planetos, as we fans like to call it. Now, these dragons are a symbolic way of saying meteors, a meteor shower. This is the cracked remains of this broken moon falling down, and these meteor impacts would cause all of these huge disasters that we see all, all across Planetos. That's the crux of the moon meteor theory. Now, it would be a huge disservice for me to try and sum up Dave's theory in just that paragraph that I gave you. So you will find a link to his Nightbringer series in the video info below. What I hope to achieve with this video is adding a support beam of sorts to moon meteor theory insofar as was to what happened to a shy by comparing a shy to Nahum Gardner's farm in the color out of space, looking at the effect of the meteor from that story, the strange meteor that lands on Nahum Gardner's farm that creates the blasted heath and the effect it has on the land, the soil, the water, the animals, the people, and how a shy seems to just be a straight up city sized version of this story. And so I present to you, the color out of a shy. Few places in the known world are as remote as a shy, and fewer are as forbidding. Travelers tell us that the city is built entirely of black stone. Halls, hovels, temples, palaces, streets, walls, bazaars, all. Some say as well that the stone of a shy has a greasy, unpleasant feel to it, that it seems to drink the light dimming tapers and torches and hearth fires alike. The nights are very black and a shy, all agree, and even the brightest days of summer are somehow gray and gloomy. The Color Out of Space, written in 1927, 
tells the story of the Nahum Gardner farm and the horrors that befell it after a strange meteor crashes on the site. The narrator, an unnamed surveyor from Boston, describes his attempts to uncover the secrets behind a shun place referred to by the locals as the Blasted Heath. He discovers that a meteorite crashed into Nahum's land over 50 years prior, in June 1882. At the time, local scientists take a sample from the meteorite and are perplexed by several strange behaviors that it exhibits. When attempting to take a second sample, the scientists reveal a globule encased in the meteorite emitting a strange color. It was only by analogy that they called it a color at all as it fell outside of the range of anything known in the visible spectrum. The following season, Nahum's crops grow unnaturally large and abundant. When he discovers that, despite their appearance, they are inedible, he becomes convinced that the meteorite has poisoned the soil. Over the following year, the problem spreads to the surrounding plants and animals, altering them in unusual ways, such as all the vegetation on the farm turning gray and brittle. The story of Nahum Gardner's farm and the corruption of the land surrounding it sounds eerily similar to that of Ashai. Ashai is a large city, sprawling out for leagues on both banks of the Black River Ash. Behind its enormous land walls is ground enough for Volantis, Carth, and King's Landing to stand side by side and still have room for Old Town. Yet the population of Ashai is no greater than that of a good-sized market town. Despite its forbidding aspects, Ashai by the Shadow has for many centuries been a thriving port, where ships from all over the known world come to trade, crossing vast and stormy seas. Most arrive laden with foodstuffs and wine, for beyond the walls of Ashai little grows save ghost grass, whose glassy glowing stalks are inedible. If not for the food brought in from across the sea, the Ashai would have starved. Compare that to the first harvest season on Nahum's farm following the strange meteor strike. Then fell the time of fruit and harvest. The pears and apples slowly ripened, and Nahum vowed that his orchards were prospering as never before. The fruit was growing to phenomenal size and unwanted gloss, and in such abundance that extra barrels were ordered to handle the future crop. But with the ripening came sore disappointment. For all that gorgeous array of specious lusciousness, not one single jot was fit to eat. Into the fine flavor of the pears and apples had crept a stealthy bitterness and sickishness so that even the smallest of bites induced a lasting disgust. It was the same with the melons and tomatoes, and Nahum sadly saw that his entire crop was lost. Quick to connect events, he declared that the meteorite had poisoned the soil, and thanked heaven that most of the other crops were in the upland lot along the road. The comparisons don't end there. As mentioned before, little grows in a shy save for ghost grass. It is an invasive plant that overwhelms other grass. Ghost grass is taller than a human on horseback, has stalks as pale as milk glass, and is wholly inedible for both horse and rider. The Dothraki believe that ghost grass glows with the spirits of the damned and will one day cover the entire world. In the color out of space, a similar vegetation becomes quite prevalent on the Gardner lands. Stephen Rice had driven past Gardner's in the morning and had noticed the skunk cabbages coming up through the mud by the woods across the road. Never were things of such size seen before, and they held strange colors that could not be put into any words. Their shapes were monstrous, and the horse had snorted at an odor which struck Stephen as wholly unprecedented. That afternoon, several persons drove past to see the abnormal growth, and all agreed that plants of that kind ought never to sprout in a healthy world. The bad fruit of the fall before was freely mentioned, and it went from mouth to mouth, the 
there was poison in Nahum's ground. Things don't end with the vegetation. Everything from the water that flows around Ashai to the description of animals or creatures that roam outside of the city and the people that dwell within all read very much like the events surrounding the unfortunate Gardner farm. The land. Every land beneath the sun has need of fruits and grains and vegetables, so one might ask why any mariner would sail to the ends of the earth when he might more easily sell his cargo to markets closer to home. The answer is gold. Beyond the walls of Ashai, food is scarce, but gold and gems are common, though some will say that the gold of the Shadowlands is as unhealthy in its own way as the fruits that grow there. Upon everything was a haze of restlessness and oppression, a touch of the unreal and the grotesque, as if some vital element of perspective or chiaroscuro were awry. But even all this was not so bad as the blasted heath. It must, I thought as I viewed it, be the outcome of a fire. But why had nothing new ever grown over those five acres of grey desolation that sprawled open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields? There was no vegetation of any kind on that broad expanse, but only a fine grey dust or ash which no wind seemed ever to blow about. The trees near it were sickly and stunted, and many dead trunks stood or lay rotting at the rim. The animals. There are no horses in Ashai. No elephants, no mules, no donkeys, no zorses, no camels, no dogs. Such beasts, when brought there by ship, soon die. The malign influence of the ash and its polluted waters have been implicated, as it is well understood from Harmon's on miasmas that animals are more sensitive to the foulness exuded by such waters, even without drinking them. Septon Barth's writings speculate more wildly, referring to the higher mysteries with little evidence. Poultry turned grayish and died very quickly their meat being found dry and noisome upon cutting. Hogs grew in ornately fat, then suddenly began to undergo loathsome changes which no one could explain. Their meat was of course useless, and Nahum was at his wit's end. The swine began growing gray and brittle, and falling to pieces before they died, and their eyes and muzzles developed singular alterations. It was very inexplicable, for they had never been fed from the tainted vegetation. Then something struck the cows. Certain areas, or sometimes the whole body, would be uncannily shriveled or compressed, and atrocious collapses or disintegrations were common. In the last stages, and death was always the result, there would be a graying and turning brittle like that which beset the hogs. There could be no question of poison, for all the cases occurred in a locked and undisturbed barn. No bites of prowling things could have brought the virus, for what live beast of earth can pass through solid obstacles? It must be only natural disease, yet what disease could wreak such results was beyond any mind's guessing. When the harvest came, there was not an animal surviving on the place for the stock and poultry were dead, and the dogs had run away. These dogs, three in number, had all vanished one night and were never heard of again. The five cats had left some time before, but their going was scarcely noticed, since there now seemed to be no mice. The water. The ships bring casks of fresh water too, the waters of the ash glisten black beneath the noonday sun and glimmer with a pale green phosphorescence by night, and such fish as swim in the river are blind and twisted, so deformed and hideous to look upon that only fools and shadow binders will eat of their flesh. By September, all the vegetation was fast crumbling to a grayish powder and Nahum feared that the trees would die before the poison was out of the soil. 
it was Amy, on one of his rare visits, who first realized that the well water was no longer good. It had an evil taste that was not exactly fetid, nor exactly salty, and Amy advised his friend to dig another well on a higher ground to use till the soil was good again. Nahum, however, ignored the warning, for he had by that time become callous to strange and unpleasant things. He and the boys continued to use the tainted supply, drinking it as listlessly and mechanically as they ate their meager and ill-cooked meals and did their thankless and monotonous chores through the aimless days. Thaddeus went mad in September after a visit to the well. He had gone with a pail and had come back empty-handed, shrieking and waving his arms and sometimes lapsing into an inane titter or a whisper about the moving colors down there. The people. By night, the streets are deserted, and only one building in ten shows a light. Even at the height of day, there are no crowds to be seen, no tradesmen shouting their wares in noisy markets, no women gossiping at a well. Those who walk the streets of Ashai are masked and veiled, and have a furtive air about them. Oft as not, they walk alone, or ride in palaquins of ebony and iron, hidden behind dark curtains, and borne through the dark streets upon the backs of slaves. The entire Gardner family developed the habit of stealthy listening, though not for any sound which they could consciously name. The listening was, indeed, rather a product of moments when consciousness seemed half to slip away. Unfortunately, such moments increased week by week till it had become common speech that something was wrong with all of Nahum's folks. Descriptions of people from Ashai are hard to come by. While Melisandre claims to be of Ashai, her use of glamours leave the appearance she gives off as suspect. Other characters we see from Ashai such as Quaith, or the Shadowbinders Danny passes in Vase Dothrock, wear red lacquer masks that hide their true features. As noted before, the people of Ashai walk the streets usually wearing a veil of some kind, or they ride hidden behind curtains and palaquins. Yet we are given a small snippet of information that may clue us in on why the Ashai mask themselves so. Monsters stood in the grass beside the road. Black iron dragons with jewels for eyes, roaring griffins, manacores with their barbed tails poised to strike, and other beasts she could not name. Some of the statues were so lovely they took her breath away. Others, so misshapen and terrible that Danny could scarcely bear to look at them. Those, Sir Jorah said, had likely come from the Shadowlands beyond Ashai. Now, take that description of the statues, couple it with everything we know of Ashai's blighting, the land, the water, the lack of animals and the hidden people, and listen to Nahum Gardner's final words in color. Whether it had crawled or whether it had been dragged by any external forces Amy could not say, but the death had been at it. Everything had happened in the last half hour, but collapse, graying, and disintegration were already far advanced. There was a horrible brittleness and dry fragments were scaling off. Amy could not touch it, but looked horrifiedly into the distorted parody that had been a face. What was it, Nahum? What was it, he whispered, and the cleft, bulging lips were just able to crackle out a final answer. Nothing. Nothing. The color, it burns. Cold and wet, but it burns. It lived in the well, I seen it. A kind of smoke. Just like the flowers last spring. The well shone at night. Tad and Merwin and Zenis, everything alive. Sucking the life out of everything in that stone. It must have come in that stone. Poison the whole place. Don't know what it wants. 
That round thing the men from the college dug out in the stone. They smashed it. It was that same color. Just the same. Like flowers and plants. Must have been more of them. Seeds, seeds they growed. I seen it first time this week. Must have got strong on Zenus. He was a big boy full of life. It beats down your mind and then gets you. Burns you up in the well water. You was right about that evil water. Zenus never come back from the well. Can't get away. Draws ye. You know something's a coming but ain't no use. I seen it time and again. Zenus was took. Where's Nabby, Amy? My head's no good. Don't know how long since I fed her. I'll get her if we ain't careful. Just a color. Her face is getting to have that color sometimes towards night. And it burns and sucks. It comes from some place where things ain't as they is here. One of them professors said so. He was right. Look out, Amy. It'll do something more. Sucks the life out. But that was all. That which spoke could speak no more because it had completely caved in. As for this well that Nahum speaks of in his final moments, it was the coroner, seated near a window overlooking the yard, who first noticed the glow about the well. Night had fully set in, and all the abhorrent ground seemed faintly luminous with more than the fitful moonbeams. But this new glow was something definite and distinct, and appeared to shoot up from the black pit like a softened ray from a searchlight, giving dull reflections in the little ground pools where the water had been emptied. It had a very queer color, and as all the men clustered around the window, Amy gave a violent start. For this strange beam of ghastly miasma was to him of no unfamiliar hue. He had seen that color before, and feared to think what it might mean. He had seen it in the nasty brittle globule in that arrow light two summers ago, had seen it in the crazy vegetation of the springtime, and had thought he had seen it for an instant that very morning against the small barred window of that terrible attic room where nameless things had happened. It had flashed there a second, and a clammy and hateful current of vapor had brushed past him, and then... Poor Nahum had been taken by something of that color. He said so at the last, said it was like the globule in the plants. After that had come the runaway in the yard and the splash in the well, and now that well was belching forth to the night, a pale insidious beam of the same demonic tint. Not a man breathed for several seconds. Then a cloud of darker depth passed over the moon, and the silhouette of clutching branches faded out momentarily. At this there was a general cry, muffled with awe, but husky and almost identical from every throat. For the terror had not faded with the silhouette, and in a fearsome instance of deeper darkness, the watchers saw wriggling at the treetop height a thousand tiny points of faint and unhallowed radiance, tipping each bough like the fire of St. Elmo, or the flames that come down on the Apostle's head at Pentecost. It was a monstrous constellation of unnatural light, like a gutted swarm of corpse-fed fireflies dancing hellish sarabands over an accursed marsh, and its color was that same nameless intrusion which Amy had come to recognize and dread. All the while, the shaft of phosphorescence from the well was getting brighter and brighter, bringing to the minds of the huddled men a sense of doom and abnormality, which far outraced any image their conscious minds could form. It was no longer shining out, it was pouring out and as the shapeless stream of unplacable horror left the well, it seemed to flow directly into the sky. 
just as the shy seems to be a city-sized version of the Gardner Farm. The river ash, with its tainted black water which glows green in phosphorescent light, seems to be like a river-sized version of the Gardner Well and its own tainted water that the gardeners habitually drink. The evil water that Nahum claims sucks the life out of you. The well where the bodies of two of Nahum's children would be discovered after suffering their own disintegrating death, much the same as their father. Twilight had now fallen, and lanterns were brought from the house. Then, when it was seen that nothing further could be gained from the well, everyone went indoors and conferred in the ancient sitting room while the intermittent light of a spectral half-moon played wanely on the gray desolation outside. The men were frankly nonplussed by the entire case, and could find no convincing common element to link the strange vegetable conditions, the unknown disease of livestock and humans, and the unaccountable deaths of Merwin and Zenis in the tainted well. They had heard the common country talk, it is true, but could not believe that anything contrary to natural law had occurred. No doubt the meteor had poisoned the soil, but the illness of person and animals who had eaten nothing grown in that soil was another matter. Was it the well water? Very possibly. It might be a good idea to analyze it. But what peculiar madness could have made both boys jump into the well? Their deeds were so similar, and the fragments showed that they had both suffered from the gray brittle death. Why was everything so gray and brittle? And that brings us to our shortest and yet most foreboding line out of the city in the shadow. There are no children in a shy. In the case of Nahum Gardner and his family, an explanation given by those who come to investigate the strange happenings, the tainted well water is brought up again. The shock served to loosen several tongues, and embarrassed whispers were exchanged. It spread on everything organic that's been around here, muttered the medical examiner. No one replied, but the man who had been in the well gave a hint that his long pole must have stirred up something intangible. It was awful, he added. There was no bottom at all, just ooze and bubbles and the feeling of something lurking under there. Amy's horse still pawed and screamed deafeningly in the road outside, and nearly drowned its owner's faint quaver as he muffled his formless reflections. It come from that stone. It growed down there. It got everything living. It fed itself on a mind and body. Tad and Merwin, Zenis and Nabby. Nahum was the last. They all drunk the water. It got strong on them. It come from beyond, where things aren't like they be here. Now it's going home. And there you have it. If we take everything we know about Ashai, the blighting of the land, the fact that nothing grows there, that the river ash is polluted, it glows green with phosphorescent light, fresh food and fresh water all need to be brought in from outside. There are no animals. The people are few and far between, and those that are there veil themselves behind curtains or wear masks, possibly to cover up some kind of deformity. It all lines up quite nicely with the events in the color out of space, the chain of events that lead to the ruin of Nahum Gardner's farm and result in it becoming the blasted heath. You combine this with moon meteor theory and remember that what caused the fall of Nahum Gardner's farm was this strange meteorite. In Nahum Gardner's own words, it came from the stone. It got into the water. It got into the soil. Poisoned everything. Now, going outside of the pages of Lovecraft, another thing to consider with George R. R. Martin's writing is that he also draws upon real life history. Ancient, medieval, but also modern. Now, Lovecraft died in the 30s, but George R. R. Martin came of age in the 60s and 70s, 
he is originally from Bayonne, New Jersey. And so, given the time frame and that location, I believe that he would also be quite familiar with the real-life tragedy that is Love Canal, and which makes the line of how there are no children in a shy ever more terrifying. <laughs> From 1947 until 1952, the Hooker Chemical Company used the Love Canal section of Niagara Falls as a dumping site for toxic waste. The chemicals had been dumped in an old canal by the Hooker Chemical Company in the 1940s and early 1950s, and then buried. Now, they were leaking into some of the homes closest to the canal. For several years, chemicals have been seeping into the basements of a number of houses, including this one, the evidence is always there. There have been instances of birth defects and miscarriages among neighborhood families. The state had been testing the neighborhood's air, soil, and groundwater and made an announcement for the homes closest to the canal. The New York State Health Department recommended that pregnant women and children under the age of two immediately move out of the area. How many chemicals have been identified as being underground here? So far, we know of 88 specific chemicals that, are, that have been identified. And of those 88, how many are suspected of causing cancer? I think the number is 11. I lost a baby before it was even born. My next door neighbor has still born. Her, her son is sick. Her son is sick. How many more kids have to be sick? Some of the protesters used provocative tactics, such as burning effigies of Jimmy Carter, his wife, and daughter. Today, the Environmental Protection Agency announced... But things changed in the spring of 1980. The EPA had conducted a preliminary study that indicated that residents may have increased chromosomal abnormalities. But before the agency could confirm the findings or inform the residents, the study was leaked. EPA was in a panic because they knew that this uh, awful chromosome study was going to be hit the newspapers. So they had an emergency team rush out to Niagara Falls to c talk to these people. We found two particular characteristics in this study which are ominous. Environmental Protection Agency had done some blood work on some residents and they said they had an unusually high number of chromosome breakages and higher risk of cancer, birth defects, or genetic damage in our children. Because the landfill turned out to be too big, too toxic, and too expensive to move, it was capped in clay and surrounded by a drainage system. They never took any chemicals out. The 20,000 tons of chemicals still remain in the center of Love Canal. I think there's a legacy of doubt because people think that someday the landfill will leak. But well, we have monitoring wells around this site. So red flags would go up if there was a problem. The homes around Love Canal, especially the homes that were rehabilitated where people are living in them today, it's probably one of the safest places on the planet to live. One of the safest places on the planet to live. One of the safest places on the planet to live. One of the safest places on the planet to live. One of the safest places on the planet to live. For more content like this, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you never miss anything. Like and comment all the things that make the YouTube algorithm happy. You can follow me on Twitter at The Gray Waste. I'll be back with more videos. Until then, support your local library.